Our sermon text this morning is from John 1, beginning with the 43rd verse. Listen now for God's word to us. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God be with us this day. May we hear your words. May we live your word with the giving of our lives. Amen. This story, which may or may not be true, I took it from one of my uh, illustrations for youth books. And the story goes something like this. A girl from the Midwest made a trip to Hollywood, California to see the sights and hopefully to catch a glimpse of a real movie star. One afternoon, she visited Beverly Hills and she went into an ice cream parlor to get herself a cone. She put in her order and then suddenly she realized that the person standing next to her at the counter was none other than Paul Newman. You can see this story was written a while ago, so feel free to put in whoever makes you comfortable. Anyway, she couldn't believe it, her heart and her stomachs were doing jumps and leaps. She tried to keep her composure. She didn't want to act like an ignorant schoolgirl from the Midwest. She didn't want to embarrass herself in front of Mr. Paul Newman. So she tried not to stare. She tried not to react or show any kind of emotion. She paid the cashier. She turned and she nonchalantly walked out of the store. When she got outside, she realized that she had left without her ice cream. <laughs> Now what was she going to do? She had tried so hard not to call attention to herself, not to embarrass herself in front of her idol, not to come across as a raving starstruck lunatic, and now she would have to go back and retrieve her ice cream in front of Paul Newman. She just couldn't do that. So she decided she would wait until he left the counter. And when she noticed he was no longer there, she walked back into the store to retrieve her ice cream cone. When she got to the counter, she felt a tap on her shoulder from behind, and when she turned around, it was Paul Newman. And he was flashing that famous smile and those piercing baby blue eyes. And he said, Miss, if you're looking for your ice cream, you put it in your purse. <laughs> We've all had those embarrassing moments. We try to make a good first impression, but sometimes in our zeal, everything can go quite wrong. This is part of the human condition, because as humans, we sometimes have a preconceived opinion or notion about another person. We deal with some of that in today's scripture. We get an inside look of a first meeting between Nathaniel and Jesus. This story is wonderful because it not only gives us insight into Jesus, but also into the human condition and into the relationships that we form. Now, to understand this, let's look at the behavior of our three characters in this scripture lesson. First, there is Philip. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, came from a place called Bethsaida. 
And in the verses that immediately precede this story, we read that Andrew was so taken by Jesus that he ran to his brother Peter to tell him that the Messiah had been found. Here, Philip does the same thing. Something wonderful occurred in his life, and he did what so many of us do. He shared the good news with a friend. It is in our nature to be in community with one another. To love each other in such a way that we form connections, that we build trust with each other. Philip tells Nathaniel that he has found the Messiah, and that said Messiah is from Nazareth. Nathaniel's response is not a mean response, he responds by asking a question. And the question he asked is in effect saying, I have been raised to believe that nothing good comes from Nazareth. You may have found someone wonderful, but if that person is from Nazareth, it is doubtful to me that he would be the Messiah. Now, Philip continues in his role as a good friend by answering his question by saying, you know, in effect, don't take my word for it, Nathaniel. Come and see for yourself. Come and check this out. Philip demonstrates something. I'm having trouble with my pages today. <laughs> Philip demonstrates something that we sometimes forget. It's very hard to win someone over to your side by engaging in any kind of argument or discussion. Once a person has made up their mind, or a person has been raised to think from a certain point of view, it will be almost impossible to change their mind. A person will always defend their position, even if it's pointless. But giving a person enough respect to allow them to draw their own conclusion is one of the kindest acts that we can commit. This is what Philip shows us. And this is especially true when it comes to our faith and our personal relationship with Christ. Our actions, our example, our response to God's call, the entire way that we live should be our way of saying to people, life with Christ is the most wonderful way to live. Check it out. Come and see. In our story, there is also Nathaniel. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about him. The Gospel of John is where he is mentioned, and he is not mentioned in the other three Gospels. And the disciple Bartholomew is not mentioned anywhere in John, but is mentioned in the other three. And most people, and, and a lot of people, believe that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. When you see them in Scripture, that's who we're talking about. But what we do know is that Jesus said in him about Nathaniel that there was no deceit. So what we do know is here is a person who was true, who was selfless, who had no prejudice, who had no pride within him at all, which meant he was open and he was ready to meet Jesus. Despite what he heard and was raised to believe, he went with Philip. Nathaniel had an honest heart, he had kept an open mind, and he did not have a judgmental spirit. Sometimes that quality in a person can get overlooked or forgotten. We can become so indifferent with our experiences in the world, it can empower us to be close-minded and, and jealous and prideful and opinionated. In Nathaniel, there were no such qualities, which means he did not let his spirit become marred by the conditions of the world. I wish they had taught that class, the, the, the pure heart, the person with no deceit. I wish they had taught that class in seminary. I somehow didn't learn that. I somehow learned about pettiness when I needed to understand empathy. I learned jealousy when I should have been studying acceptance, and I learned hardness when I could have been learning about forgiveness. And that's what Nathaniel reminds us. He reminds us all to keep our focus on Christ, to follow in his ways, and to strive for an honest and a pure heart. 
And finally, we look at what Jesus teaches us in this passage. The first thing he does is at seeing Nathanael, he says, he makes this big, bold statement. He says, he says, in this person is one with no deceit. This tells us that Jesus had, that Jesus has the ability to look right into a person's heart. That is one of the ironies about life. There are times and there are moments in everyone's life when we feel emptiness. We feel loneliness. We see ourselves as being misunderstood. We mistrust others because someone along the way has hurt us. And we are too vulnerable to take that risk to allow people to enter into our hearts. But in Christ, we never need feel this way. Because we have a Savior who has been there, who knows the depths of humanity, who can see into our hearts and souls. A Savior who embraces who we are, forgives us each indiscretion, and loves us even when we feel abandoned. A Savior who walks alongside our journey, wipes every tear from our eyes, and embraces us in our darkest moments. And when we face death when we're at our worst point, and unfortunately we all will. We have a God that invites us to come home to eternal life, into the paradise that is heaven. And sometimes we spend our lives looking for meaning and fulfillment and satisfaction and contentment. And as much as we strive for these things, we are left empty. But this journey need not take place because the God of love, the Lord who has always been at our side, can give to us everything that the world cannot. This is emphasized in the last <coughs> verse of today's scripture. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is a reference to the story of Jacob's dream in Genesis 28. Jacob dreamt that he saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder that stretched from heaven to the place where he was sleeping. In this dream, Jacob realized that he was in God's presence. He renamed the place where he slept Bethel, which means the house of God. The point of this reference is to, gem, gen, is to demonstrate that Jesus is not just a messenger from God, but the means by which humans can have an authentic relationship with with God. This is what Nathanael encountered when he recognized Jesus as the Messiah and he became his disciple. When we, like Nathanael, are brought to Jesus and we live a life of service, we learn that serving Jesus is all about discipleship. Meaning how we give thanks, sing our praises, share the good news, how we pray and study scripture and live out our faith and speak of God's truth and power. How we follow Jesus as individuals, as a community, as a congregation, as the larger church, as Christians in this world. In everything we do, from the very core of our beliefs, right down to how we pick and choose our stained glass windows, we live out a very simple message. Christian discipleship is our willingness to walk with Jesus every day. This is what our story for today teaches. This is what our characters convey to us living in the world today. Philip was moved by Jesus and gave up everything and followed him. His willingness to walk with Jesus made his heart reach out to his friend Nathaniel, and his willingness and openness to meeting with Jesus convinced him that he was the Messiah. Jesus looked into each man's heart and saw the good and the potential of what they could be. And Jesus does that for you and me. Now, one of the things that I am interested in is I love words. Not really a manly thing to say, but I love words. I got this from my parents. My dad had the most fantastic vocabulary. And he was constantly, 
I'm not saying I've got a good vocabulary, but this is what I learned from my father. He was constantly challenging us. He would sit us down and he would give us words and he'd give us a word and he'd say, uh, uh, the, the word is promise. How many words can you tell me that mean promise? And so we would learn vow and oath and covenant and testament, all meaning the same thing. And he was very good at that. He was great at collective nouns. And he would pound that into us all the time. Collective nouns are a, a train of camel, a tower of giraffe, a, a, a gaggle of geese, and so on and so forth. My mother was great at words. In, an, in another way, vocabulary also fantastic. But my, my mother also could, she, she got very upset if you talked about someone in the pronoun form when they were in the room with you. You would never say, she said that, you would say, Della said that. And my mother would throw a fit if she heard that. And, and God forbid if you ever used um or like in a sentence, or you pronounced the T in often. <laughs> That was my mother. So taking the best from my parents, one of the things I do with my children that involves words is I like to take two words that people use interchangeably when they're not supposed to, and I like to know the difference in those words. And I promise I won't correct you when you use them because I hope I'm not my parents. But, <laughs> but, but, but I like, and, I, of, and poor Colin and Lindsay, I correct them all the time. <laughs> But what I like to do with my words, for, for example, there's a difference between barbecue and grilling, and we use them interchangeably. Barbecue is done at a very low temperature for a very long time, and grilling is done at a very high heat for a very short period of time. So when someone says, come on over, we're barbecuing hot dogs and hamburgers, they're not. <laughs> they're grilling hot dogs and hamburgers. There, there, there is a difference between, there's a difference between poison and venom. Venom is injected, poison is ingested, yet we use them interchangeably. The one my son taught me, there is a difference between a mole and a double agent. A mole switches sides. A double agent has always been on that side. That is their job to infiltrate and to change. And so this is what, oh, and, and the last one I've got to do, there's a difference between cement and concrete. And, and it drives me crazy when people don't, I bite my tongue, but <laughs> cement is the powder, concrete is always the finished product, but we use them interchangeably. <coughs> and to make a point in this sermon, in this story, there's a difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer changes to adapt to its environment. If you have a thermometer and it says 70 degrees, and you walk outside and it's 80 degrees, in a short period of time that thermometer will change and it will say 80 degrees. It changes and reads the environment. A thermostat sets the environment. A thermostat controls the environment. If it is 80 degrees in your house and you want it to be 70, you set that thermostat to 70 and it will lower your room to 70 degrees. That's the difference between a thermostat which changes to an environment, a thermometer which changes to the environment, and a thermostat which controls our environment. So the question for today, the Christian question to ask is, which are you, a thermometer or a thermostat. God wants us to be thermostats. God wants us to change, to change this world, to do God's ways, to make this world see the goodness of God, and to change people to make that happen. God wants us to be a thermostat, to set God's ways, to set God's tones, to set God's love in this world. God does not want us to change and be controlled by others in this world. God wants us to be the change in this world. That's what Christ is for. That's what discipleship is for. That is what we are for. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day. Help us to be the change in the world and help us to be your instruments of peace now and always.
Amen.